PSI prides itself on being the providing the ultimate in customer service. That's their goal. Uh, you see on their website that the tagline is, you'll come for the software but stay for the service. And I think the success of any technology project uh, is based on that, the customer service aspect of that, because software is software. Although software can be better or worse depending on um, which program you're purchasing. But the fact is, it really depends on people, right? Processes and communication, which is really, really important. And so to get to the finish line in terms of an implementation project, what you really need is all three of those things working in tandem together, like a choreography. So we're gonna ask the panelists here to introduce themselves because each one brings a different piece of value to large technology, small technology, whichever type of technology project you're you're talking about in terms of their interaction with uh, the customer. And then we're gonna get into some questions. So let's start, you wanna start in the middle or start with Urias, okay. Trevor, Trevor. Trevor handed me the mic first. Okay. Uh, my name's Urias McCullough. I've been with CHSI Tech for seven years now. I just had my seventh anniversary. Uh, prior to CHSI, I was, oh, so at CHSI, I am a director of implementation, which means I spend a lot of time working on implementations. Uh, my specialty is, is with the public entity pools um, and uh, the multi-line uh, quoting and um, areas of the system. So I do a lot of not workers comp stuff uh, as well as workers comp. Um, I work with JPAs like Rick here um, and other public entity pools. I'm sure there's at least one or two here. Mm -hmm. um, prior to CHSI, I was uh, doing same type of work for another uh, organization. Uh, since 2001, so a 17 years. Hey, thanks, Urias. He's a traitor. <laughs> uh, my name is Trevor Lightbound, and I'm the VP of Implementation. And what I do is just sit back and let these guys make me look good. Uh, uh, really, they do make me look very, very good. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate working with Urias and Colin. I manage projects. I started out being a BA. I've been doing IT project management for, I don't know, 18 years now. Even though I look young, I'm actually kind of old. So my wife makes me moisturize and stuff. <laughs> I've been at CHSI for seven years. And uh, I'm from Canada and working on that green card. But uh, today we'll go through questions. Pat has a series of questions and she'll talk to us. We've been doing these for a long time, all of us combined. Uh, it's almost 60 years of projects, I think, combined when I did the math. So it's a lot. We're kind of some, we can be like old hens sometimes. So we'll try to stay on track, but uh, we have a lot of stories to share. And uh, hopefully you get some valuable intel or just be entertained. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Um, my name is Colin Moulton, um, one of the original <clears throat> tech employees, I guess you want to say. I'm the one who originally wrote Connections to start with. Uh, I've been with the company for 14, 14 and a half years. Uh, coming up in January, I'll hit my 15 year, so I want to count that half right now. Um, I primarily stay on the work comp side, so I am the work comp expert for these people. Uh, so if any of you are doing work comp implementations, I've had a finger in it somewhere. And I'm usually on your email. You type C, it comes up with my name, right? <laughs> Unless there are two Collins in your office and I'm getting their emails, which has happened. <laughs> and that's rare. Um, oddly enough, when they like talk about like the history and stuff, so I've been with the company for 14 years. Prior to that, I was a paramedic. I wasn't doing insurance. I didn't have any, I was on the other side of insurance. I was on the provider side. So I learned, I learned the ground up with you guys. I actually went out on a back injury and I learned work comp as a work comp Claimant. injury. <laughs> wow. So I learned what not to do and how to get past it. So now I work for you guys. <laughs> so wow. that's me. Great, thanks Colin. Okay, so what I've learned working with CHSI for the last few years is that every small company is, operates a little bit differently, or medium-sized companies as well. I think we could look at the large players and say, yeah, well, they pretty much have these departments and these business units, and this is how it always goes. But not, not so for smaller companies. So what I'm gonna ask you is that with smaller companies, who usually plays the role of project manager? And what are any challenges that are associated based on wearing many hats? 
I'd say the an underwriter or accountant is usually the project manager by default, only because they seem to put their hand up at the right time. I'm not really sure, but we don't work with true project managers typically with our companies that are out here. Um, it's very rare, and uh, I really would like to stress the importance of that, but a lot of the budgets don't allow it. So the challenges that come from that, you know, an underwriter only knows their area, right? Their area of expertise. Um, they may not know the billing side of it. They may not know everything. They're also not sort of versed in projects to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, they have their day job to do that is a full-time job, and now they've been thrown into this implementation, which really should be another full-time job. So Synergy Comp's been fortunate where Caitlin's been taken out of the mix, and it was made her full-time job, and that leads to success. So a lot of different issues that can come up there. Um, I think the biggest one is just no project experience. Mm -hmm. It's hard for us to work with a company that uh, they don't know how a project should be run or how it, what phases it'll go through. Mm -hmm. So do you find that there's a lot of education that's going on from, from you to the client then as you go forward? How does that work? Yeah, sometimes yes. quite a bit of it actually. Um, I was just going to chime in real quick on Trevor's, and we can touch on that a little more. When you think about where we start in an implementation, it's always with underwriting, because that's usually the first part of an implementation. And that's why the underwriters get snagged first. Then they get stuck in there for the rest of it. So when you talk about like not knowing the entire project, you're saying, how does what underwriting is going to do, the outcome of the policy, how does that affect billing? Are they the right person to answer that question? Sometimes, yes, they know the full price. Small groups, they know the whole thing and they got it all. You get to the bigger companies, they're like, I don't care. The bill get generated, done, I walked away. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we do run into that. And then we hit the billing people and they're like, well, that's not right. <laughs> so it's sometimes the first one out the hat is the one we get to work with the most and then they get dragged along. Like if you start an underwriting, now all of a sudden you're a billing expert and next thing you know, you're doing compliance. Right. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. Urias, you want to add your two cents to that one? So uh, one of the things I've run into is uh, sometimes um, the reason we end up in uh, an opportunity is that there's somebody new at the company. Often, oftentimes, like an underwriting manager. Sorry, I guess. Uh, underwriting manager who has no clue even what they're getting into. Um, and that's a very big challenge, um, especially if they don't even know how the uh, how the business is run. Um, they're trying to change it, <clears throat> change it for the for the better to add technology. Uh, that's that's an interesting challenge. And sometimes we have to help uh, reverse engineer what they're currently doing, and uh, we find that 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 can be time consuming. Right. Right. Good. Thanks. Okay. So I don't know what your uh, experience is in terms of working with the customer's internal goals. Like when you first sit down and have that conversation, um, there are obviously many aspects of this that you don't control because you're working with a customer who is, has their own agenda, their own goals, and they have their own styles of communication too. So um, how do you manage through those issues? Let me look at Trevor's okay. cheat. So we get, we get an interesting thing that happens kind of often, and we're trying to get around that now. Our sales team will speak to some executives at a company. The executives will buy this product with their own set of goals. I want it to be you know, cheaper, faster, stronger, whatever. Um, that project gets handed off to uh, the, the underwriting team, the accounting team, whoever. All of a sudden, the goals of the executive and the goals of that team are completely different, sometimes not even communicated at all. Mm -hmm. So we get, you know, hey, they want to do uh, this to improve efficiency in this area. All of a sudden, first meeting we have out of the box, it is, hey, can we integrate with this third-party agent system? And we're like, what is this coming from? So first off, we have to get the goals on. Uh, they have to be established right away. So what we've been doing now and changing is reiterating, this is what you're buying, this is what you're buying it for. The very first meetings and all of that now, don't, we don't even start the projects now until everyone's aware of the goals and exactly what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And if they're expecting something different to go live, they better tell us up front because they're gonna sign something now saying that this is what I expect. Mm -hmm. Then we focus on that as, as part of the project. 
Well, it does sound like a lot of it is expectations. A lot of it is keeping those lines of communication open, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I have another note here. Too many chefs in the kitchen oh. impact priorities. Yeah. So the goal of one person is different than the other, and sometimes personalities in your company can play a part in what gets done first. Right. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> something uh, Tyler had done earlier, which is like a great segue into that question. When you talk about following a policy through and you talk about the status as it moves through and you report on that, Initially, when it's set up, the underwriters go, no, we don't care. We don't want to do that. It's extra work. I'm not volunteering for extra work. Um, but if they know ahead of time, if we know ahead of time, that is a goal. And you want to track that through and you want to be able to report on that, then we're going to steer you into that. But if you don't tell us you ever want to do that, we're like, I'm not going to do it either, right? So <laughs> knowing those goals ahead of time, we can set up some things early on in the implementation and get it right versus trying to backfill it later, which is always more painful and leads to much longer implementations. Oh, yeah, a story about that. <laughs> so Ur Urias and I just did one, and that customer's not in the room, but we they got a great contract this year. It was, it was pretty good. He comes to us and says, in two weeks, I need this whole thing to be done. I don't have reinsurance, and I won't be able to be a company, a real company, until I get this. Can you finish the entire underwriting in two weeks? So this guy didn't sleep for a couple of weeks. The problem with that is, yes, he got reinsurance, and yes, they're now an insurance company. We have, we've skipped a million steps in this whole process. The goals have been scattered so far. Other people come in, don't know where we are, and there's complaints later on. A month later, there's what's going on with this or that. You know, We should never have done that in hindsight, but sometimes we make concessions for different types. But... Um, we're trying to learn. We're, we're getting better. We're getting a lot better than we used to, but we're still learning as we go. Okay, good. Well, and it really does lead into another question that I am going to bump up here on the list, which is what is the process you follow to get to the bottom of your customer's requirements? How do you really ferret through all the workflow issues and all the what-ifs um, within any variety of different customers? You want to go on your multiple answer? Boy, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, initially, it's just data gathering, right? We need, we need to see everything we can get our hands on to try to figure out what this project's going to look like. Uh, and that's basically any spreadsheets that they've already got, uh, any documents they already generate, anything and everything we can get our hands on. Just, you know, we, we basically get it in bulk zip files full of junk that we then have to, to parse through. Um, so I spend as much time as possible up front going through any material I can get to identify uh, what lines of coverage they're working with, approximately how they, how they quote those lines of coverage, what types of documents they already generate out of the system and send to their, their insureds. Um, we spend as much time up front as we can trying to get information so that we can then lay out sort of a, a schedule of discussion topics. Uh, and then we, we just kind of get on the phone with the customers and we start going through everything that we've got and asking questions. And more often than not, you say, oh, great, okay, I understand that. And they say, well, actually you don't because there's these five other versions of that file that we didn't send you and they are you know, significantly different. And so it, it kind of blossoms into this giant snowball process. Um, but we document as much as we can. Um, we start kind of putting things out on our roadmap. You know, we'll, we're not going to tackle that this this month or this week, uh, but we will work on that after we're done with the current process, and uh, and we kind of lump things into categories. And, and more times than not, I think we're getting what the customer thinks is the full requirement. We'll do our research. We'll look at the doc. We'll look at the spreadsheets. We understand, and we we go for it. Mm -hmm. But what we learn later is that. You know, after we do a prototype, there's something completely missing. And we can't find that. If you don't help us or, or get, us to get, get us that information, we can't find it right off the bat. So prototyping is sort of a way that we do that, where we're building something out, a process. We think it's 100% based on the requirements we received, but really it was 90. And then there's a cycle of feedback and a round of iterations to make that what you want it to be. So it's common. It's very, very common. 
Well, just like the ebb and flow of any project implementation, uh, changes happen and, and requirements change. Um, I don't know if, if you want to talk about how you handle the requirements that change midway through a project. For example, what if a company's acquired while you're still in the deepest part of the discussion about customer requirements? You know, how do you manage through all of that? No, I'm sorry. It's like, oh, hey, we bought another insurance company. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> um, you can only do as much as you can. We try and get as much information out of you, and it kind of goes off what they were saying earlier. We try and get every piece of paper possible because that, you may not know to tell us something, but if I look at a piece of paper and it says, oh, they're looking for this number. Well, if I don't store that somewhere, I'm never going to put it on a piece of paper for you. So, you, you know, trying to second guess. We do try and get a little bit ahead and, you know, second guess that kind of stuff. But when these things happen, and they do happen, like I said, we've had customers halfway through an implementation go, hey, we just bought another carrier and we're rolling them into our program. Surprise. You can't quote the other one yet, but you gotta do this one today. So you do it. <laughs> you know, it resets expectations. Um, we do need to be better and good at communicating that, that hey, you know, we talked about this price tag over here. It's now different, because this is a no different program now. But it's all communication. As long as we're up front and tell you, up front knowing, hey, you know, this is different. And we're gonna say, hey, hey, you know, I do it in meetings. I know Trevor does it because I'm in half of his meetings. We go, that's not, that's different than what we talked about before. Let's talk about that. Do you really want to change that? Because we can change it. Or do you just want to stick with what you got and we'll look at this later? You know, because you can punt things off going, let's just finish and put that off to later. Or say, we can rotate right now and put it in and just redo the entire implementation. We've had to do it before. So we're flexible. That's all we can do, right? And we just ask that you guys are flexible, too. <laughs> we curse, too, <laughs> yeah. when things change. Yeah. Well, there is a mute button on the phone. Um, I don't curse that much, though. Yeah. Well, and if you, if you think about it, um, the insurer isn't in control of an M&A, a merger and acquisition, any more than the vendor is in terms of being deep in a project. It's happening around both of you. Mm -hmm. So, and and if these questions sound a little bit, you know, pejorative or on the negative side, uh, my goal in in having this discussion with these gentlemen is to have you all think about the fact that this is happening internal with your own organizations and how you work through issues like bottlenecks, for example, or something that happens that changes your workflow process or something that somebody is new, a new employee that didn't really understand the training that they provided three months ago. I mean, there's all of this discussion now is to help us all better be better educated on uh, smooth transitions and smooth implementation. I'm gonna ask you about bottlenecks. Okay, so where do they typically occur during an implementation, and, and how do you manage through that? They keep wanting to fall off. For us, it's the paper. Thank you. So that all the documents that you require to come out of the system, they take the longest amount of time. Mm -hmm. So depending on how many you're asking us to make, that will be the largest bottleneck. Uh, mostly because we use the same resource that built the algorithms, look left and right right here, to build the reports because they know exactly where they put all the information in the algorithm that calculates premium. We have other resources as well, but um, there's a finite set of resources at our company. You saw our office. We are not Microsoft. We don't have 500 people in one office. So we uh, have to schedule these out, and they take a lot of time to build. Either one of you want to add anything to that? Well, we talked a little bit about, obviously, bottlenecks, but um, I do want to address scope creep because I think um, if anyone's ever worked for any company that has new software coming on board, I think scope creep becomes a real factor, and I, I don't think there's any one reason for it, and I'm not sure there's any one solution for it. But do you want to give us a couple of examples of where scope creep was something where you needed to re rethink where things stood and reevaluate the implementation? It happens all the time. So you can't stop scope creep. It's, it's happening every day. Someone's coming up with something new that's not on the original plan. They don't even know there is a plan. 
they don't even know there's a statement of work because there's some new employee or there's something. Mm -hmm. um, so requests are coming into our inbox every single day that are creating scope creep on your projects every day. Um, how you manage it really is, you, you, I wrote you can't, you just, you just figure it out. Um, it depends how big the scope creep is. So sometimes they come and they change the entire course of a project. Those have to be really addressed. Um, and it depends on the time. If you're within time or budget, you can handle a little scope creep. Otherwise, we have to be diligent and say, no, we'll do it after. Put it in the parking lot, we'll do it later. Get live, we'll do it later. Okay. So. I would only add one other part to that, especially on the work comp side, um, because we are so heavily regulated that it may not be your choice. The state may come down and say, we need you to do this next week. Um, looking at you guys, when the state of Tennessee decided to do a split rate right in the middle of a month, in the middle of an implementation, where everyone had to be split rated. And they're like, well, we weren't ready. <laughs> so, but it's dictated to you. It wasn't their fault, it wasn't our fault. State government came in and said, we passed a law, now you have to change everything. That happens a lot in work comp. So we just gotta deal with it. You know, we're, we'll do it, so. Uh, probably one of the biggest ways to manage scope creep is to actually know what the scope is. <laughs> and I think um, that can bite us uh, very often because we won't uh, often document or fully understand the scope uh, up front. Uh, we know in our minds what we believe the scope is, but we maybe didn't agree with the customer 100% on what, what we would and would not do. Um, so that is a big part of the management, I think, is documenting what we will and will not do up front um, so that at least when that happens, we have something to go back to uh, so we can discuss it with the customer and there's no hard feelings. That's part of the process. Yeah. What about education um, when it comes to new workflows or new software efficiencies that you know you're um, coming through development on the CHSI side? Um, how does that work? Do you work with one team member from the client or from the insurer, insurer, and then they take that training forward? Or how important is it to get that education where it needs to be? Let me start. Uh, I think it's preferable to work with a single point of contact um, as much as possible, um, at least through the initial project implementation. If there's too many people involved, uh, I think it goes back to the first topic where there might be conflicting goals and we don't want that to happen. We want a single point of contact that all decisions go through um, and all understanding of what we are and are not building and, uh, and the requirements go through that person as much as possible. Um, that's not always realistic. There are going to be parts of the software that require a, a subject matter expert from another department, um, and we will pull them in. But if we can keep uh, at least the initial project manager, I'll use that term, from their side involved in that process, um, it, it heavily benefits the outcome. As far as training goes, I would say um, training the trainer is always a good thing. And we would do that as much as possible. I think realistically, we end up doing um, screen sharing with a group of people on the other end. Uh, and we may do one or two of those to get the entire organization sort of wrapped into the, the process. Mm -hmm. But we do, we do f hope that at least one or two people on their end are going to maintain that training process. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Um, I, I would just add to that, it's like when we, because we do meetings with almost all of you here, fairly uh, weekly or, or at least bi-weekly, if there's more than one person or more than one expert in the room, you know, we kind of ask, it's like, try to all be there and attend these meetings, even if it's not about you, because there's an implication. Like, hey, we may change something on quoting and underwriting and policy issuance that affects billing, but the billing person wasn't there, didn't complain about it, now they're going to deal with it. <laughs> And then you're going to hear about it later. So it's like, because we didn't know, hey, did you think to ask so-and-so in accounting if this is going to hurt them? They're like, nah. Um, chances are it does. So you know, keeping track of who on your team maybe, even if you're not really involved, because a lot of people go, nah, I'm not in this one, so I can skip this meeting. You might be, you know, and things might happen around your back and you didn't know about it. it happens with claims too. So. And, and every call 
platform we're on is an educational opportunity. I mean, a lot of times, you know, ask me, hey, what about this area? I say, why don't we look at it right now? Let's go to, uh, go to a meeting and, and we'll do a 15 minute training right now about something. So it's very educational as well. So we're constantly, even though, um, you know, you guys have been using the system for years, we're still learning and teaching them information that they can pass on. And I expect Caitlin to go and teach her loss control people what she just learned. Mm -hmm. I brought up uh, mergers and acquisitions earlier, and I didn't ask a question that I just have to throw in now, but um, have you encountered uh, a customer that lost interest, I don't know how else to say it, or isn't invested in the outcome of a project, whether it's for whatever reason, M&A is what triggered it in my mind, but have you encountered that, and how do you deal with that halfway through your implementation? The answer is yes. Yes, okay. Oh. Um. Your eyes says the most recent experience on this. Let's. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. So um, the example that Trevor is referring to is a customer who maybe was more satisfied with the solution they already had um, and wasn't necessarily interested in investing in a new technology solution. Uh, spreadsheets are great, apparently. You know, everyone, <laughs> everyone loves their spreadsheets. And when they're, when they're forced to give those up, um, it, it tends to create some grumpiness. I'm sure you all know this. Um, what we ended up doing, uh, interestingly, was um, we compromised on a few of the spreadsheets. And rather than throwing them away and rebuilding some of that technology in connections, um, we took their existing spreadsheets and uh, used uh, one of our reporting output features to generate, to basically pre-fill that spreadsheet with data that came out of connections. Not quite the same as what Tyler showed you before, but something where you click a button and out comes a spreadsheet and it's pre-filled with data using all of their existing formulas. Um, so they could then take that and fiddle with it to their heart's content and upload it to the file archives if they wanted to retain it. Um, so that was one thing we did that I, I felt helped alleviate some of that frustration. Mm -hmm. um, but the other example that I've run into multiple times are uh, employees who feel like the system is going to, what's the word I'm looking for, replace them? <laughs> that can be an interesting challenge as well. Um, and, and usually what the strategy that I found works best is to uh, get them invested in the idea that they will no longer have to do this boring grunt work, that they'll be able to um, become more valuable as an employee uh, because the system's going to take over some of those tasks and automate them for them. Um, and they'll be able to grow within the corporation. And the corporation will grow as well because uh, you know they, they need less people doing menial grunt work. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So you gave Peggy her spreadsheet again. <laughs> Anything else, Colin? No. Well, the other thing is I'm thinking that these sound like negative questions, but they're really not. I th hopefully, you're all taking a lot of positives from them. And I have a positive question here that um, I want to make sure that I ask, and that's what type of things tend to land as an aha uh, with your clients when you're working with insurers um, through the middle of the implementation to the end? Um, what are some of the things that the insurer says, oh, right, oh, that's awesome. There's a lot, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, you said it wasn't negative, but I, my first thing is negative, actually. So the aha moment I'm going to describe is actually with, uh, with you guys, where I think your CFO has discovered that the lockbox process works, is in theory great, but in real life practice, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. So spend a lot of time working with the bank setting this up, you know, spend a lot of time doing all this stuff, and then once, it, once you actually put it in production, real life kicks in, and the way that you're getting data isn't what you thought it was gonna be like. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an aha moment, the opposite way. The, a positive way, though, we get better visibility cross-departmental teams. So accounting doesn't have access to underwriting stuff usually, or the opposite. So they're finding things now just by running reports or clicking around, and they're able to, I guess, ask better questions and kind of be more informed as well. I would just agree with that, that it's more about the sharing of information. 
We talk about, you know, that's how Connections got its name, because we connect things together. Um, never, there are people in your organizations that had never seen claims data put together in a way where they could just go drill down and look at the claims. Now they can. So, you know, you got an underwriter who doesn't have to go to a claims person and ask for a report or ask for, you know, loss runs. They can just say, oh, here, I'm looking at it in line well before a renewal and go, wow, this is great. I can do this. Or they can see uh, and evaluate, you know, survey come through. You know, those are all things you're just sharing information. And all we're doing is putting it in one place for you guys to look at it. So, yeah, that's all positive. Yeah, one of the most favorite things about when we when we're doing projects is when a customer sees something, and they're surprised by the functionality. I didn't know that your system had this screen that showed me all those cancels and all. Uh, I didn't know that this report did that. That's great. It, that's probably the best for us. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow when we do some demos, a lot of people say, "I didn't know that uh, you, you could do that." I've been using this system for five years, and I didn't know that. So. It'd be your new tagline. You can do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, how would you describe the relationship with a new, new insurer client? Um, how would you describe it at the early stages of implementation versus the late stages of implementation? It's kind of like early on, everyone's like, ooh, excited. And then later on, they're like, oh, we're so tired. Why are we still doing this? <laughs> Everyone in here, right? We've done that. Um, there is. There's a little bit of that. It's like everyone's excited for a start. But the opposite is also true. We've had some people where they're like, we don't want change. We're not here for change. This is horrible. And at the end, they're like more enthused and engaged. It kind of goes part of that previous question. Um, and, and that's kind of fun for us because we see people get more excited and stuff. Then we've also, you know, we've done this with other people where it's like you start meeting with them, you're meeting with them every single week and you're doing the same things over and over. And, you know, it's informational, but then towards the end we're like, do we really need it this week? No, let's cancel. Um, and that's totally acceptable. We're on the same boat as you guys. So <laughs> if you guys are like, we don't want to do it today. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it can be exhausting, but it's, it's fun. Right, this is our, it's our day jobs, we might as well have fun doing it. So we all like learning new things. We, we learn about you guys and everything you guys do that's different. And I'm sure you've all heard us in meetings where we go, we have a customer who does it this way. And you go, oh, show us one of their reports. It's like, yeah, if we did this and this, oh, okay. You know, we're acting as a middleman in there and that's why we have this where this is the big middleman where you can talk to each other and say, you know, or ask us like, who did you say was doing that? And you can go talk to them and find out what they're doing. It's like and having Tyler come up and show what they do. I mean, who, who else was excited by that, you know? So it's, that's kind of the good thing. When you're the long-term customers, like we've got uh, the Michigan folks, they are the first customers. Other than CHSI, Megan's still here. Um, so it's like they're still here and they're still coming to this stuff because it's exciting. So that's, that makes us happy. Yeah, it's definitely, at the end, it's, there's a sense of partnership. Um, our department's actually called Partner Services, not because we go and look for third parties to partner with, but we're partnering with you guys. Uh, we're, that's how we feel, you know, when we talk to you guys, we're kind of an extension of your company as well. We're a phone call away. And uh, a lot of you work and use us like that. Urias, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. No, we got some time. I, I'll just say that I, I feel like projects are kind of a bell curve. Um, they start off nice at the beginning. Everyone's excited, like Trevor mentioned. Uh, it gets really painful somewhere in the middle. Um, and then as you get closer to finished with a project, <laughs> um, everyone feels better about it again because they're starting to see things gel. Uh, there's results. They're seeing functionality that they can use, which is important. Uh, and then after that, it just kind of smooths out. Uh, you know, maybe a couple of rocks here and there as they trip over things that they didn't realize were built differently than they wanted. Um, but but more or less, the project smooths out at the end. So I, there's just there's usually just a really nasty area somewhere in the middle where everyone's really angry with each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important to think about this partnership aspect because um, you know at some point uh, you're called upon. For advice, you know, because obviously we don't all have all the answers. I don't know why everything wants to slide off of this thing, but it does. Oh, there we go. Oh, there. Maybe because I've been pushing down on it. Sorry. But anyway, along the idea of partnerships, um, 
developing trust, developing those relationships, setting expectations, and then managing through those expectations, that's all good stuff because it plays forward to their a credible source, obviously, um, for advice, right? And so what I'm gonna ask you next is to offer some advice to help uh, avoid roadblocks, for example. What are some tips um, to avoid roadblocks or to avoid communication glitches or to avoid um, falling behind, for example, when you're in the middle? Uh, it's all about expectation management right from the get-go, from the sales cycle right through the beginning. So we just had a, a new customer uh, sign a couple months ago, and the very first email I sent them was a projected schedule based on not much. And I wrote in a whole paragraph on that email that said, do not tell this to your executive team. Do not tell this to your board. This is a preliminary schedule based on what we know right now. If you hang your hat on that, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's on you. It was, I used some pretty hard words in the very first email I sent to that customer. That's right. For a Canadian, yeah. That's the, as bad as you can tell anybody. <laughs> but we're trying to get in everyone's head. If I tell you it's going to be done on Friday, that's great. We're doing our best to get it done on Friday or whatever that date may be. If you go and tell your CEO, he's expecting it on his desk on Friday at 9 a.m. When that doesn't happen, things roll. Heads roll. If it comes in on Monday at 9 a.m., it's a failure. All right? So managing the expectation of when you're delivering something is super important. Uh, it changes everything. That successful report that came in on Sunday, because Urias worked on the weekend, knew it was done, had to be done Friday, didn't get it done till Sunday, it's a failure now to the CEO who expected it. So how you communicate to your deadlines to your agents, your brokers, is very important. Poor Dave Maloney, wherever he is, sent me, showed me an email a month ago. It was from uh, an underwriter who in the email thread agreed to a report I can have this done by Friday. Wrote an email to Dave Maloney and said, can you do this report? <laughs> it's Wednesday right now. You know, that's poor expectation, man. That's a failure in the eyes of the, the agent on the other end. So I, I think just that is the most important thing that we're trying to focus on now. Just making it clear. Proactive. Uh, I, I would just add to that is like, because we're guilty of that. I know we all are here. Um, in the middle of meetings, we'll, you guys will go, oh, can you do this? And we'll be like, of course, sure, yeah, no problem. That's not like, do it, and we need it by Tuesday. That's just us saying, yes, we answered your question, done, we walked away. We forgot about it before, by the time we hang, hung up the phone. And then we get that, well, where is it? Why isn't it done yet? Um, <laughs> we need to be better. It's like, did we just make a verbal contract with you guys to do something? Um, so you're going to hear us more and more get into the phone calls going, now that you've asked for that, is that something you want to talk about internally? Because that's usually sometimes where it needs to go. Um, or are you expecting me to turn this around in a certain amount of time? And we'll tell you this will now have this time frame because we need to be a little more upfront about that. Because we're like going, of course it can do that. You know, we're all gods. Um, I know Rick Kropelko over here has heard me say that since the day we first met. Can you do it? Of course. No problem. Still waiting for things, aren't you? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're guilty of that. We know we are guilty of that. And we, you know, you guys are guilty of you ask a question. We just we answered the question. We didn't say that we would do it. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. You know, so. A tip would be to make sure we're aware of that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What about your philosophy as it relates to implementation customer service? Since I touted that when I first started talking, you know, you'll come for the software, stay for the service. Um, I know H in the CHSI acronym stands for honesty. So who would like to tackle that question? What the philosophy is of the company as far as customer service goes? The most honest person I've ever known. <laughs> Maybe call. Maybe call on too. <laughs> Um, yeah, sometimes I say things that people don't want to hear. <laughs> it's painful. Uh, 
and I like to be upfront. Uh, if if I if I'm going to tell someone, um, I'm there's no way I'm going to hit that deadline. I mean, I try not to tell them that. Instead, I just frustrate my family and spend all night working on things. But um, I'll just tell them it's not going to happen this week. It, it's you got to do it right. You can't. It can't always be a friendly conversation with the customers. Uh, so. I'm not always as good at that as I should be, <laughs> especially up front, as Colin mentioned. Sometimes I'll say, yeah, that can be done without indicating when or how it's going to be done. Um, I just know in my head it can be done. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, trying to be honest with them as far as what is and is not possible, uh, that's definitely um, something I focus on. And then um, if I'm just not going to do it, by the period, by the time frame that they they want it done, I, you gotta be gotta be truthful. Yeah, the general philosophy is that we're gonna partner with you, right? You're not just a customer; you're a partner, and we'll support you through the implementation as well as after the fact. Um, Colin, your eyes, and I are always supporting our existing customers. We don't just shelf ship you off to support and talk to Dave's team. <coughs> we're around. You know, and some of the more advanced things we'll need Colin or Urias to actually figure out. Great. Colin, anything to add? Well, we've got about five minutes. I don't know if you want to open it up to questions from the audience. See if anybody has a question for our team. Here's one. No. <laughs> uh, it's all dependent on what you guys need when you hit an implementation. Some people, when they start up, they're like, oh, you know, we're, we're hitting our 1-1 renewals. So we want to start there, and that's our, that's our focus. So all of a sudden, you're doing renewal-based stuff, which is different paper. It's different everything versus even new business. And then there's some people who are like, we're, we just did our renewals. We don't want to look at renewals for a while. Let's start with billing. Let's get all of our billing up and going. And then we'll trigger off the next series of renewals and then new business kicks in there. So it's, it's more dictated by the project and what's going on. So you know we're flexible enough to do it in, in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't even have to start with like billing or underwriting. It could start with evaluate. It could be the very first part we walk into. Um, or claims integration. We've had people who say, yeah, we'll just get the claims in, then we'll deal with everything else later. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, whatever, whatever's needed, I guess we're hitting whatever pain point is your focus to begin with, is that's how we're going to start. So. Yeah, we do. Uh, Lee can help you kind of go through the whole list. He's right in the back there. But tomorrow's a good time for you maybe to go through some demos and you'll be able to see what, you know, Bill, your boss, had the demo. This is a great example, right? He bought the system, he had some goal, and now it's yours. Yeah, it's a good example. Right? What does this system do? He doesn't, no. I don't even think he has a login. <laughs> But we do have a list, and we do have descriptions of what, what it is, but uh, showing you is probably better. So tomorrow there's multiple opportunities to show you different parts. And, and even off that list, is that those are going to be the high points. You know, we, can't, we don't list everything. The program is huge. You know, I mean, Richard could tell you how many millions of lines of codes we're up to, right? Uh, tomorrow's Slack time, there'll be several demos throughout the day. Um, ask other people. Because they went through it yes, last year when we did it, and it, got, it was just huge. People just clustered around a little screen, because we didn't even project it. And just looking at all the new functionality, that's like, that's not new. That's been there since 2004. You know? And that, that's stuff out there that, you know, and it's hard for us to remember. You know, like I've been doing it since 2004 when I first wrote that module, and I'm like, oh, I forgot it was in there. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So we all do that. It's like, you know, there are pieces in Muni that you're like, uh, we touch that once a year, maybe. So, you know, we'll try and fill all those gaps in. So, always ask. Is there a question? Do you have any plan to outsource any of your processes or employ the code? Radu? <laughs> There's two of them in here right now, right? 
Yes, absolutely. And we're more than happy to do it. Or if you have an internal source, um, one of our customers, uh, Gallagher, has an internal source at their corporate office that will be doing like report writing and data management. So it's kind of third party for like the local branch, but up there. And then the long group does compliance in some of our claims imports. And Radu is back there. He does reports for one of our other customers. He's an independent contractor. So yeah, no problems with that kind of stuff. And, and Ruth, don't forget Ruth. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. We haven't been using it overall because it takes a lot of time and none of us are a full-time project manager. We've actually just enlisted the gentleman back there, Daniel Ertz, to be our new guy to, to handle all of our, our items. So that's a daily job. That's, a, that's part of his daily responsibilities where it's hours, hours going through and maintaining that. That's the only way that it can work. And Daniel and I have spent countless hours of going through processes and it only works if you maintain it. So we haven't been doing that over the years. So we weren't producing pretty Gantt charts or anything like that. None of us are PMP certified. None of us are, you know, we're workers. We're, we're doers. Uh, but we see the need now to do something with software. So we're using one called Teamwork. And uh, I think over the next few months, Daniel will probably be giving all of you access to Teamwork to take a look at your projects and see what you have outstanding and have estimated due dates on them as well. So that's something that we're really striving for in 2019 to make our life easier and make your life just much easier as well. So. Yeah. Knowing, I think a lot of times one party removed from you, be it the CEO or a client, wants to know well, where are you in the process, and then can I have my stuff? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, but it's a, you're right, it is a thing. I think that's why we did keep up with it as well, because it takes you two hours a day just to write down what it was that you did and what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. We're factoring probably half his day every day just to go through all the work every day. It's a real thing. It's 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 huge. It's huge. Just it. The scope of the project is so big. It's hard to keep tabs on every little thing that's going on. And then, of course, you know, we've got usually like four things going on. Yeah. Four projects. So that's it. We have more than four. Yeah. No, I mean, with you guys, we have probably ten things going on right now. Yeah, it's good feedback. You're right. There's things that we can do with a report or a configuration very quick, and then we'll do something else. We'll say, oh, we need a developer, and there's a schedule to follow. Sometimes it's, it's just ridiculously difficult to 
because there's nothing in there already that allows us to say that pop a button and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know. I, I have one comment. We've been very disciplined to work with because we can't get our own stuff together for that. <laughs> and I don't think that I'm alone in this room when it starts it. So I want to defend the, the, the organization because you guys can always, we come in to a meeting with you and ask you what if or can you probably 10 times and you always say yes. We don't even know if you want it. We're just asking you to do it. So I think it's kind of an interesting dialogue we're having here about need to be accountable and what time frames and stuff. I just think it's a, a more um, uh, elaborate conversation we can have. And it's like you just said, Chuck, you know, we can, I've asked many times, can you do it? And the answer is yes. I didn't need a due date because I didn't know I really needed it. So I just wanted to say that because that is an interesting conversation we've always had. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one of the challenges you have is you have a big team. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people want to have that decision and Tyler has a question. So it's actually more of a comment, just a positive comment, or kind of along the same lines. It's, we've often had questions about whether you can do something, and the response has been, yeah, but I don't, I'm not sure you really want to do that. <laughs> you know, and uh, here's why, you know, here's, here's the I reason. I push back why. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I just, I think that's a great response from the team, because often the people asking questions about the system are not necessarily subject matter experts, mm -hmm. and to have other people bouncing that off of us to say, yeah, you, you can, but the right way probably is to do this, and here's, you know, so thank you. For yeah, yeah. 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 I'll, yeah. Know what we've done, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely piggyback off of that, because I, I run things through a column a lot uh, to pay dividends um, out of the system, and, you know, everything I can, he'll always write it back, you know, it's going to affect the dividends. <laughs> Uh, What's I know that's in there? That's his email <laughs> signature, though. Yeah. I always, I always like the fact that no matter what idea, big, small, medium, it always brought us back to that because that's the most important thing for us, for sure. He knows that. He helps, obviously, set it up. Um, but also, it, utilizing the system sometimes as the end user, um, you don't know. just about where you want to go because you know the whole pro program it came from and what it could do. <laughs> so it's just kind of right. copy that and paste it in and then you're like, oh wow, all of these buttons are here. <laughs> um, which one do I really need? So it, it evolves for us. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it does for everybody, but um, our, our needs kind of grow. So yeah. one thing is okay. time. Yeah, no, and you know that brings up kind of a good point that you know I always talk about like I'll push back on a, anyone's on a phone call with me gets pushed back, um, and a lot of it is because like with you I'll say this is going to hurt your dividend, yeah. you know I'll do that for you, but anyone who's in a traditional market with work comp I'll be like, you realize compliance reporting, this is going to be on there. It's like oh no, don't put that there, <laughs> you know. It, there's like trickle down in there. It's like going oh yeah, if you do this, state reports, state's going to find out, but we could hide that. If we know ahead of time that you don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll do those, you know, roundabouts going, yes, but. So we'll, th I throw out the but as much as I can, you know, sit there and go, are you sure? <laughs> you know, get, get a couple answers before we actually do it, you know, so it's, it's an excellent point to bring that up. Yeah, one more question. Um, usually, you guys have always encouraged us to come to you individually and say, you know, here's something we'd like to see fixed, or here's something we'd like to do. I find it a lot more interesting if we're all sitting here and we're saying, you know what, we, I'd like to see this come out in this office, and about five or six other people chime in and say, yeah, I would 
That's a question for you. <laughs> the advisory board. Right. Well, if I can talk about the advisory board, I'd like to, Lee, thanks. Um, and thanks for bringing that up, because um, this, the opportunity that we're offering is for professional peers to come together, competitors or not competitors, doesn't matter, um, and share what your, your dreams are, your goals, your challenges, all of these things in a five question format that you would get once a month. And then those results are, it's, it, it leads to qualitative research that I can publish later on behalf of all of you, but without your names, so that it's, it's a painless and safe way to learn from each other. So that um, at the end of the month, I'll tally everything and put everything together and then we'll cycle back that information to you on a quarterly basis that says, well, we asked um, a question about uh, loss control or you know, if there's been what your biggest pain point in loss control is. And I think this is low battery. I think that's why it's doing it. But anyway, maybe I'm talking too much. But, <laughs> but anyway, the, the advisory group is a way to network, if, it, if nothing else, through email. But we've talked about this, maybe using WebEx or Zoom or other tools that we have at our disposal and bringing people together for a, an open discussion, what works, what doesn't work. So I highly encourage you to let me know if you're interested in that because that feedback is good for you and it's good for us um, in a way that we can, like my mom used to say, the rising tide brings up all the boats. You know, Well, everybody learns from each other in a safe environment and that's basically what it's designed to do. So, okay. Of ideas, oh, how right? Do you say, well, how do you put that commission in when you don't have X, Y, and Z? Or something? Right. That's why that was a real thing. Was helpful to have. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. It wasn't structured. So Pat, Pat's well, offering was, a structured plan to yeah. go. You know, each month, mm -hmm. something to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not time consuming. It's relatively painless, really. Uh, quick and easy, and then, like I said, I'll, I'll uh, digest all of the results that I get, and we'll put it into a format that everyone can learn from, and then we'll circle back with that. We're going to start a newsletter for CHSI, and we may publicize the reports internally in the newsletter as well, so that people can see, oh, so in this case, this situation was solved in this way, that kind of thing. So. Great. Well, thank you, Colin, Trevor, Urias. I think this has been very instructive and uh, great dialogue. So thanks to the three of you. Okay.